The lights, the candle, the flames, I should say, are telling me that it is time to reorder lamp fuel. <laughs> and I have been traveling a considerable amount this summer, and so I'm a little bit behind with that. Our opening congregational song today will be um, on page 40 of our old pink song book, and it is Joe Hill, and we will be singing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5, and our accompanist today is Kristen Hampton. <laughs> Place. We also acknowledge that in the 1800s, 
1800s, the Muscogee Creek people were driven from this land and we support justice for all indigenous people. My name is Patton White and I will be facilitating today's celebration of life. Yeah. And glad to have everybody here in attendance. <clears throat> if you have any, um, actually before we get to that, I'm going to, as our opening activity, invite people to rise in body or spirit as you were willing and able. And we're going to give ourselves a little bit of a chi shower. Drawing down heavens, this movement is called. So we're going to reach out to the sides and brush our palms down the front surface of the body. And inhaling as we again gather up energy from above and bring it in. Exhaling and again inhaling and exhaling. And with this next gathering of energy, feel as if you were sending it down the back side of your body, even though your arms are going in front. And then with our final two, this one's coming down the center of the body. And then our last one is going to gather in. And take the hands and then just rub them together. And you may retake your seats now. Hopefully with a little bit of a shift in your energy. <clears throat> if anyone has a community announcement that they would like to share uh, later on, in the service, please write it down. There's uh, things to write on and with back there where Mary is currently writing something down. <clears throat> Do we have anyone here for the first time? Or yes, would you like to let us know who you are and how you came to be here today? Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Kirsten. This is obviously my first time here. I found out about this congregation actually just yesterday from a thread on the Reddit website. Huh. Yeah, cool. And I thought it sounded really interesting. I'd never heard of any place like it before in America. <laughs> really anything like it before at all. And I just was really curious to check it out and I thought it sounded really nice and just like a really um, nice and meaningful, productive way to spend it. Well, welcome. And can, you, can you remind me again of your name? Kirsten. Kirsten. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for choosing to join us this morning. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And I would love to hear more about this Reddit thread at the end of the service today. <laughs> Any other new folks? All right. Then. Uh, anyone have a birthday or anniversary to celebrate today? All right, then we'll move right on to our next congregational song, which is on page 58, Pasture of Plenty, in our old songbook. The pink one. Page 58.
At this time, I'd like to welcome our fellowship minister, <coughs> Reverend Marshall Michener, to come forward and share whatever you're feeling like sharing today. Marsha, let me get you a mic. Decided, uh, but uh, I figured it would probably be a very nice day to have it outside. 
We'll keep our fingers crossed. See what happens. All right. Pat, <coughs> what is that date? Seven, Saturday, I'm sorry, Sunday, September 17th. Thank you. Not the next Sunday, but the weekend after that. All right, so we are going to now go into our period of a time of silence, and you can use this time uh, however you wish to. We are just in community with one another quietly for a period of time. We do have candles on either side of the sanctuary if you would like to light one for whatever reason. Thank you. 
I didn't play it like I did last week, but thank you for all mm -hmm. for the love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dead <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Gratis and So, um, I find it interesting that my birthday has um, arisen in many ways over the past uh, couple of weeks. Uh, my birthday is on March 4th, and this coming birthday, I'm going to have a really big birthday present in that uh, at least one of the many a multitude of trials that uh, will be taking place over the next few years will begin. <clears throat> but um, uh, I, I had known many years ago that uh, up until the 1930s uh, that my birthday was also inauguration day. And I only recently found out why that had been picked as the day for inaugurating the new president. And that was because that was the day that the Constitution was actually formally adopted. <clears throat> and um, one of the people that uh, I have, uh, I have like a... Uh, I would say it's a, an ed education crush on these days, is Heather Cox Richardson. And she is a historian, I believe, with um, Boston University. Um, <clears throat> but she lives in Maine, and she writes uh, just about every single day uh, a, um, uh, a perspective on uh, current events through the lens of history. And um, today, or yesterday, is the, the one that, that came out uh, late last night, early this morning, uh, starts off on March 4th, 1858, so that was 104 years before I was born. <clears throat> South Carolina Senator James Henry Hammond rose to his feet to explain I thought that was an interesting use of uh, a, a term to explain to the Senate how society worked. Let that sink in for a second. That this guy is going to explain to the Senate this is how society works. Not, you know, as an opinion of this is how it should work or you know, anything like that. No, this is, this is how society worked. He says, quote, in all social systems, he said, there must be a class to do the menial duties to perform the drudgery of life, unquote. That class, he said, needed little intellect and little skill but it should be strong, docile, and loyal. <laughs> such a class, so continuing on, quote, such a class you must have or you would not have that other class which leads progress, civilization, and refinement. Hammond said, his workers were the mud sill on which society rested, the same way that a stately house rested on wooden sills driven into the mud. <clears throat> so then she goes on to say uh, later on, on September 30th in 1859 at the Wisconsin State Agricultural Fair, rising politician Abraham Lincoln answered Hammond's vision of a society dominated by a few wealthy men. While the South Carolina enslaver argued that labor depended on capital to spur men to work, either by hiring them or enslaving them, 
Lincoln said there was an entirely different way to see the world. <coughs> Representing an, an economy in which most people work directly on the land or water to pull wheat into wagons and fish into barrels, Lincoln believed that labor is prior to and independent of capital. That, in fact, capital is the fruit of labor <clears throat> and could never have existed if labor had not first existed. That labor can exist without capital, but that capital could never have existed without labor. Yeah. Hence, they hold that labor is the superior, greatly the superior, of capital. So all of that is just an introduction to our open mic, um, which we haven't done in many years, and um, and this format just simply opens the floor up for people to share. Um, in this case, we are sharing our own stories of labor, whether that was labor that we toiled in, or perhaps labor that um, our parents did, or siblings, or friends, or whatever. And so I have set up the mic down here just because it's a little bit more uh, reliable than our uh, wireless mic. But if you would like to share a labor story, um, raise your hand. Let me know. <clears throat> Jan, would you like to be our first uh, person down here at the microphone? Well, I was actually managing. <laughs> uh, I was the senior customer service manager at the airport um, for 20 years. And if you've ever been to the airport, you see all those people out there that are guiding people through the lines and helping people do this and that. These are the customer service reps. Uh, I managed them, so it wasn't like a phone center management. It was actually on the floor every day with the people. And, uh, you know, of course, I've got a million stories. <laughs> but, uh, there's one pretty funny one. Um, my afternoon supervisor, who was a black woman, in Suzette, and this very old couple came up to her, and the woman said, can you tell me where the white sun line is? <laughs> and Suzette so was like, uh, what? Well, and you know, the husband was like trying to pull her away, and, and she was like, yeah, where's the white sun line? And she, Suzette was just kind of stunned, and, and she said, well, you know, we don't, really have a white on the line. The woman was very insistent, kept insisting, and so finally Suzette, being a very quick thinker, realized that it was February. And she said, oh yeah, you know, we normally do, but because it's February and it's Black History Month, we've decided that we're just going to let everybody go through the same lines. <laughs> and she seemed to be satisfied with that. <laughs> oh yeah, you got all kinds. But uh, there was one day, I'll never forget, uh, walked into the office and the CSRs were in the back of the break room is, and, and I just wandered back there to say hi. It was about 8.40 in the morning. And they were all glued to the TV. And I was like, what's going on? And so the plane just flew into the World Trade Center. And I was like, was it just like passing a little plane? Or? And they're like, we don't know. Um, it didn't look like a little plane, but I was like, oh, kind of passing your plane. And then, you know, a few minutes later, here comes the second one. And we're all just standing there, just stunned. And I had remembered a uh, FAA briefing <coughs> about a month earlier where they told us that um, they had gotten some threats that they considered serious from Osama bin, bin Laden. I had never heard the guy's name before that point. And this was about a month before, and they said we needed to be extra vigilant because they would be looking, because they were looking at airports for things to happen. Um, when that second plane went in, and 
then the third, and the Pentagon, and then, you know, we just, all I could say was, let's get on the floor. We didn't know what was going to happen, and we were, you know, we had to wait for word from the FAA, and then they finally said, well, yeah, you got to evacuate. If you ever tried to evacuate that airport, <laughs> it's, uh, it was not easy because they all had to come out. We didn't have the, um, at the time, the, the international concourse where they could go out that end. They all had to go out from there all the way to the end and out. And we had people stacked up in the parking decks, which probably wasn't very safe. Um, sidewalks everywhere. And, you know, people were asking us questions and we just didn't know the answers. You know, we didn't know the answers. All we could say was, you know, we'll let you know when we know something, because they were all wondering if they could go back in and get on the planes. I don't know. It was, um, it was really, you know, teary thinking about it. It was scary. It was weird. And, and you know, it took uh, a couple of hours at least before we got the word that they weren't going to have to do any more flights. So at that point, then we had to accommodate people trying to, you know, what are we going to do with them? You know, um, and you know, fortunately, a lot of the neighbors came and you know brought people to their houses. The hotels obviously filled up very quickly, and you know, we, it took most of the day uh, that whole is that evening to you know, find accommodations for everybody. Um, the worst thing was they, they said that if, if you're not if you're a non-essential worker, don't come to the airport. But I was considered an essential worker. I don't know what I could have done, but so I had to go in the next day. And uh, just walking through that atrium, and there was no soul there, was the, I can't even explain the feeling. Uh, it was just, I don't know. Um, and then the consequences, of course, of that was were insane, you know, everything changed all of a sudden. Um, and when they made the changes, they were like instants. You know, when they decided you can't have liquids anymore, it was like, just like that. If you had gone in before they made the decision, you could carry your bottle of wine. If it was after three o'clock when they made it, sorry, got to turn it in. You know, they made no accommodations for nursing mothers, because they didn't, you know, everything was just so crazy and nobody knew what they were doing. And it took a while to really get it together. And then we had the incident where one guy was down in the train concourse and, and uh, train level and realized he left his camera bag upstairs. So rather than go all the way to the other end to get the uh, escalator, he ran up the down escalator. And we had to close the entire airport and evacuate again. The entire airport, because we didn't know what this guy was doing. Uh, he even made the Today, to the Today Show. He was taken to jail. <laughs> he was actually on the Today Show, kind of being shamed for closing in the airport. He said, I was just trying to get my camera back. Uh, anyway, um, it, it changed everything about our working life there. Nothing was the same after that. And of course, nothing was the same in any of our lives after that. But being right there at the airport, it was. Um, it just was, I don't know how to explain it, you know, I just knew that we had to go into a completely different mode of how we thought and how we worked. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I have to say that those CSRs, those were the working class, those were the ones on hourly wages, and they were beautiful and brilliant and came through in ways that I just, never even expected, so just glory to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And uh, do we have other folks who'd like to share the story of labor? Mary, come on. So uh, we heard a lot about where you were on 9-11. Uh, I just thought I might 
talk about uh, the job I had uh, at 9-11. And uh, I worked at a hotel up uh, in Lenox, uh, near Lenox Square. And I was with housekeeping, and on that particular get day, September 11th, uh, 2001, I was uh, cleaning the lobby, um, vacuuming, uh, stocking the bathrooms, and stuff like that. And uh, uh, the um, people at the front desk, uh, there was someone from the front desk who said, hey, you know, the Twin Towers, have been planes flying into the Twin Towers. And I thought, mm, yeah, okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just continue, <laughs> continue, you know, and uh, gradually I started hearing it from guests and things like that. So, and at lunchtime, uh, I became very aware, very well aware that in fact this was, was happening. Um, but uh, I mostly just wanted to talk about that particular job because um, shortly after that um, was when I first um, got in touch with First E. And the way that happened was that, um, well, uh, from the lobby, I went and worked in the laundry room. And uh, we were, at that time, I worked different shifts there. We were doing the night shift. So um, we were folding linens and all that and had, had a really, really busy day. So there was a lot left over, which we were going to do, we would probably be doing the next night or whenever the traffic slowed down. And I, you know, that was never a big deal because that happened regularly. But uh, the very next day, our supervisor, uh, uh, house, head of housekeeping, um, who was not the person who hired me, uh, the person who hired me actually um, was much beloved, and uh, she had breast cancer and actually had passed away, so they had to hire this other woman. Uh, but she called us in the very next day and said, hey, you know, this is not okay to have all this laundry left over. What have you all been doing? You know, we've been working our tables off. And uh, um, so, uh, uh, you know, I mean, we all knew that uh, this happened on a regular basis when there was no traffic, and I just couldn't contain myself. I said, you know, this really sounds like a lot of bullshit to me. And, and so she kind of went off the handle with that a little bit, and, uh, and the next day I was called in human resources and I got a pink slip. So, um, and Willie was, uh, what I was married to at the time, was just so upset because he'd been at so many jobs where rough language was, um, I mean, the, saying that word bullshit was not really considered in many minds as being terribly rough language, uh, especially since it wasn't directed at anybody. It was just yeah. the words you were saying sounded like, you know, but anyway, uh, uh, I went to apply for unemployment, and uh, 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 and then my job called me back. They decided they didn't. And I thought I don't want to go back there. And then I realized, of course, that I wasn't going to be getting any unemployment. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was kind of in that shape where uh, I really didn't have a job for a little while, and that's. Uh, Around when I first started going down to First Eve, we were living in Candler Park and uh, in a house along uh, McClendon that is now, you know, much more tony than it was then. Um, but um, I wanted to just give a shout out to all those people that I worked with at the hotel because there was something very loving about that group of workers. And uh, uh, of course, everyone loved Miss Ellen a lot, but my supervisor, Rosemary and Florine and Fanny, Fanny was, well, most of the workers were Latino, and Fanny could have, um, was Latino, Latina rather, and uh, could have really had her own business, because anytime there was a major event, she would make this beautiful sponge cake that was about as big as the cakes you could get at Publix, but so much better, very creamy, uh, the cake was so light, you could eat an awful lot of it without uh, getting overwhelmed. 
And uh, then, of course, my coworkers, Ernestine. Ernestine, actually, a lot of them, several of the women actually were very pregnant on the job and worked up through their ninth month. Ernestine's <laughs> waters broke at the hotel. And, uh, and so that was kind of a, uh, exciting moment. just uh, amazing, amazing group of people. I, I really enjoyed working with all of them. And um, uh, I'm not much interested in going back to hotel work or anything like that. But, yeah. um, uh, I think it's a testimony to why so many workers are so um, tied to these jobs that are not terribly meaningless because there are just so many really wonderful and loving people there. And uh, so that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, come on. Yep. Uh, Hi, uh, I wasn't going to share, but all this talk about September 11th in 2001 reminds me of a couple of things. One of our people here who's not here today, Kitty Wimbus, had a birthday just two days ago. And um, she worked for Delta as a flight attendant for 32 years, a job she really loved, right out of college, kept the same job. And as soon as the terrorist attack happened, she quit. She took an early retirement. And I know from talking with her that a lot of her co-employees at Delta did the same thing. My own experience, one of the people that I work with, a, a good friend of mine, his name is Zach Harrison, uh, um, he was delivered on Tuesday, the 11th of September, 2001. Uh, he had a graphics job. He had to deliver to one of his customers, Southeastern Tennis, up in in Lilburn, so I helped Zach load it into his vehicle, his pickup truck at the time, and take it up there. But while we were at his house in uh, Oakhurst, we weren't hearing any news. So we got there to the tennis court company, and I stayed outside in his truck, at his truck, and he came out with a friend of ours who also were, were, were worked there. And they told me, this was about 10 o'clock, you know, that the, you know, that the, uh, the t terrorist attacks had happened. So, before we dropped off the job at the tennis court company, Zach and I, had heard about an accordion that was at a, a uh, not a thrift shop, it was a pawn shop. So we planned on going and looking at that that day. So about noon, one in the afternoon, we drove to the pawn shop and I tried the accordion out, you know, but one of the, ex they had the TVs on there. And they already were captioning what was happening. It said something like, America's newest war. You know, it's almost like, well, it's happening, you know. So anyhow, a lot of people were running into the pawn shop, looking at it and buying guns. They were freaking out. So that's the work I did. That, as it turns out, they gave us a good price on the accordion. <laughs> One of the things I played to try it out was, oh God, it was, well, it was the door song, uh, uh, Light My Fire. It wasn't meant as a joke, really. So anyway, Zach thinks I lightened up the mood there a little bit. So anyhow, what a day of work. It just blew everybody's mind. All right, I guess that's enough. Thank you. Sure. Great.
Yeah, and a great tagline, accordions, not guns. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to give a shout out to the men and women, but mainly women, that work in hospital cafeterias. When I was in high school, I had a job working in the Bartlesville, Oklahoma, a little oil town cafeteria and on the weekends and I was back washing, the people were just real nice, but I was back washing all this stuff, I mean it's hot as hell and uh, the, they, they had to close out at the end of every day on a cash register. Well Bartlesville had great public schools so, I mean, I was taking trigonometry in high school, you know. Anyway, so this poor woman's trying to balance her cash register, and she is just getting absolutely overwhelmed by it. And so, you know, I, I helped her. I said, well, you know, you add up this, and you subtract that, and if it doesn't, I mean, it was so easy for me because I had grown up in an educated family and so that from that moment on I know they no longer had me working washing stuff in the back they had me up front teaching them how to balance out their cash registers and those people all of a sudden I turned into their pet and they were, they just watched out for me, they watched out for each other, that job was awful hard. And uh, so I want to give a, boy when I'm in a hospital now and I see those people working in the line, serving food, I take the time to talk with them. So yeah, wow, hard working. Anyone else? I will share. Um, Can I just say, everybody, shout out to my daughter. I'm thinking about her. She's a member of the Screen Actors Guild. She's a, script, she's a screenwriter. And has been on strike now for a few months. And, and I'm trying to pull her. So, I'm proud of her. So, uh, my very first job. Um, was child labor in that uh, we had yeah. chores to do at home and I was thinking a little while ago that, um, that one way I could look at it is that uh, did anyone do one of those um, tests that you get in like high school at the aptitude test what what are you what are you you know what are your interests? What are your interests? Uh, what what would be a good job for you? And so, if the if the choices of our uh, of our potential chores uh, when I was a child were the aptitude, um, I chose because I enjoyed it for whatever reason. Um, the clearing the dishwasher, emptying the dishwasher, and putting the dishes and cutlery away. And so um, I think that uh, speaks to my organizational skills. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, how that translates into writing grants, I'm not sure exactly, but there is a lot of assembling of <clears throat> attachments and that sort of thing. And, but, uh, but then my first paid gig, or paid work, uh, again, while I was underage, <laughs> was delivering newspapers. Yeah. And, um, and I was thinking in terms of the, the, with that particular job, the, the marriage of labor and capital. 
that I experienced because um, I was working with these friends of our family who basically for our little town they, they, they organized all the paper routes and so I was part of this team and on Sunday mornings because uh, they came out early and their, the papers were so much, you know, they were like this thick and far more difficult to try to um, deliver than <clears throat> what I could do on my bike. The capital in this case was the car that, uh, that we would load up with the papers and we would all go on all of the different routes uh, with that particular thing. So, um, in a sense, uh, there was that cooperation um, between labor and capital. Um, on three occasions uh, over my working life, I have had the opportunity to join a union and each time I chose not to for different reasons. The first one was when I was a junior at Emory and needed to uh, work to earn tuition and um, housing money. And so I worked at the little Kroger that was that used to be down in Emory Village as a bag boy. <clears throat> and after working there for like about a month or so, the union representative who worked there, uh, he came up to me and he, and he said, we need to have this meeting that it, it's just, you know, something that that all employees um, need to go through and here is your option. You can choose to join a union or you can choose not to. He was really advocating that I do it, but he also recognized, oh, you're just an Emory student, you know, that, that you're not really going to spend uh, much longer working here at the Kroger. And he was right in that sense because um, uh, I was interested in departing that job as soon as I could. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but it also just, it, it, it began to educate me about the unions uh, from, from that worker standpoint. That, um, you know, a different point of view than I may have been getting in some of the classes I was taking at Emory at the time or in some of my previous experiences. The second encounter with potential union uh, joining was when I was cast in a, an equity touring production of 42nd Street in the summer of uh, 1993. And again, uh, with, with the performing union like that, you have to qualify first to be able to join the union by being cast in a, an equity production. And, uh, and so I did have that qualifier. But you know, for, for me, it was, it was a harder decision in this case because while I knew that uh, equity, and actually I, I'm realizing this was, this was technically the third in these things, but that um, if you join the union, then it limits the non-union work that you can do. And here in Atlanta, there's, uh, there's some equity productions in, in theater, but very little uh, that would be that, that I would qualify for with the dance-specific performing that I was wanting to pursue. And so, it, again, it just didn't make sense for me because um, uh, it, would be, uh, it would be more of a, a challenge than a benefit. But um, prior to that, uh, I was cast in a, a TV commercial um, that was for the state of Georgia and uh, like a tour Department of Tourism thing, and uh, one of the other dancers with Deacon and I uh, were filmed in front of the High Museum doing a little dance move. And <clears throat> um, that qualified me to join Screen Actors Guild, SAG. And uh, again, you know, 
Uh, it was very unlikely that I was going to be getting a whole lot more uh, film work, um, and so I chose not to, but with it, simply because I was continuing to get residuals uh, for that commercial, um, I actually qualified for their health benefit for an entire year that was like the best health care plan I've ever had that I didn't have to pay a dime for. And so, again, that's, that is, shows the power of the unions. And so, while I'm like, can't you writers just get this thing figured out because I miss my Stephen Colbert. Yes. I stand with you because you need to, you know, keep keep working to get uh, um, the best return on yeah. your labor. Yes, fruits of your labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone uh, have anything else to share before we wrap up? This has been very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Then we are going to uh, finish up with a final congregational song, which I'll tell you about in a second, and then we'll have one last little movement today. <clears throat>
Alright, so remain standing if you are, or if you're seated and want to remain seated, you can do this as well. But we're just going to do a little bit of a shake the tree, which is loosen up your knees, your ankles, your hips, and let the, all of your joints bounce and shake. And bring a smile to your face. This is an instant mood enhancer. <sighs> and we are going to go out into the world and make a change today. Have a great rest of your weekend. Next Sunday, we will um, be welcoming Beth Michelle, the chair of the Native American and, in, and Indigenous Studies at Emory uh, on Emory's project with the College of the Muscogee Nation. Please come back next Sunday. We'll see you then. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen.